And um, thank you, everyone who's still here, except for numbers 184 <laughs> to 87. Um, you all who were here this morning would have heard um, Deb Cole mention the Hall Technique. And um, it is indeed a really fantastic um, and exciting intervention that we're really, really um, happy to have be, been working with a number of clinicians and agencies over the last couple of years in looking at the, um, the success and, the, and, and this technique within the Australian context. So I want to talk to you today. I haven't got very much time, so I'm just going to really briefly go through with you what we have found with our pilot study of the Hall technique and then what we're now doing in the next phase of the, of the research. Um, it's... Sorry, it's working. Am I meant to be pointing this at anything? Sorry. Anyway, oh, I'll start talking. Um, the the whole technique is pretty much just a it, it's a it's a very simple, minimally invasive way of preserving primary molars that are carious. Um, and it's using stainless steel crowns. And it's not picking up a drill, not picking up a needle, but very, very carefully selecting a case in, in young children um, where you would have a decayed primary molar that um, has not got extensive decay. So we, um, with our pilot study, were funded for, um, from DHSB with a research and innovation grant and um, in conjunction with North Richmond and uh, North Richmond Community Health, thank you, and, um, and the University of Melbourne did this sort of investigative research into um, the acceptance of the technique. Now, the technique itself, um, like I said, no anaesthetic or drills required. It can be used to um, conserve hyperplastic primary molars as well, um, and it's a matter of, of choosing the right size to fit the tooth and cementing the tooth on with GI, cementing the crown on with GIC. And like I said, it's really important that we have very careful case selection. So I'll just tell you a little bit about how we do that. But basically, we know that stainless steel crowns are the most effective and enduring uh, rest restoration for primary molars um, compared to all other other restorative techniques. And um, there has been research done um, over in the UK where the whole technique has been used for many years. There's been research that has shown that um, it can uh, um, reduce tooth extractions and, um, and any extensive treatment. There's been a randomised controlled trial done over there over five years. But it's also got the potential to improve compliance in young children because of clearly that Less, less invasive manner in which it's used and to reduce the anxiety that's associated with dental treatment. Um, we know from DHSV data that only 3 to 4 per cent of children who have caries in their primary molars are actually, have those primary molars restored with stainless steel crowns. Um, so we think that um, the use of an e easier technique will actually increase the use of stainless steel crowns. Um, and so it, it's also got the potential to avoid these negative child health impacts of repeat treatment um, and also um, in conjunction with a preventive program, and this is where it fits very well into these minimally invasive models of care, uh, we can hopefully reduce hospital admissions and um, we know that um, dental treatment is the third most common reason for hospitalisation of children, so we want to really be able to prevent those expensive, um, um, costly admissions, which are in excess of 2,500 per child. OK, so in our pilot study, we aim to look at the success of the technique to manage carious lesions in three to five-year-olds, and these are in high-risk carious children, and to determine the acceptability of the technique to both the public um, oral health practitioners that we were training, and we trained four dentists, um, and the preschool children themselves and their primary care, carers, which is mainly their parents. Um, we uh, um, evaluate, we, in terms of case selection, uh, we chose in these children one or two primary molars that had carers in the outer half of, within the outer half of dentine. So an example is this tooth here, for instance. And there needs to be a very clear band of dentine between the advancing decay and the pulp horn. 
the tooth must have no pulpal symptoms and no pathology, pulpal pathology on, on radiograph. So the radiograph is a really essential part of the case selection. Um, we use in the pilot study uh, the International Carers Detection and Assessment System, the ICDAS, to actually score the surfaces, each surface of the primary molar. And then we also had a scoring system for our radiographs as well. So we trained four dentists in the hall technique itself and we trained them in the ICDAS and we calibrated them in the ICDAS. The, there are specific contraindications for the hall technique just to get through the clinical side of things and so obviously it would be absolutely um, crazy to put a, a crown over something that's got obvious signs of pain and pulpitis. Um, and any clinical or radiographic signs you, of um, periradicular radio, um, pathology, you would not put a, a stainless steel crown on. So that, hence, it's really important to have a radiograph. Um, and also, if a crown's so broken down that you wouldn't normally be able to restore it, then it's not going to be ideal for a, a hall technique crown. Okay. So in our study, our pilot study, we placed 22 whole technique crowns on 14 children and it took an average time from time of testing for the size of the crown to finishing cleaning off the cement uh, of five and a half minutes. And in the few cases where the occlusal vertical dimension increased by only about one and a half to two millimetres, it reduced again by 30 days when we reviewed the children. All the clinicians reported that it was a much easier um, procedure to perform in conventional restorative techniques and that the children who had the crowns had very positive behaviour and that the children generally um, experienced little or no discomfort and then we asked parents what their reports of the children's discomfort was and that seemed to correlate with the um, dentist's reports. Just, I've got a, um, three examples I want to show you of um, clinical uh, radiographic outcomes from the pilot study and they're quite instructional in that um, this is a four and a half year old child and uh, ex excuse the um, clarity of the radiographs because they're very highly magnified and they were um, scanned. Um, so this uh, 7.5 had occlusal caries and you can see there's a clear band there of dentine and there's no pulpal pathology. So the whole technique crown was placed. And we were following these children up at 12, at six months to do a review and then 12 months to do a radiographic review. Unfortunately, some of these children, they're high risk and they don't come back regularly. So it's really difficult to necessarily see them at the 12 months. But however, this child was finally seen at 21 months and a periapical taken and the tooth is perfectly sound. So we would call that a success. You might note, and I've put these red arrows here, that there, and it's difficult to see, but there was definitely some enamel caries in this bite ring. Look what's happened here, 21 months later, whereas that occlusal caries was restored with no full coverage, which is what the whole technique affords, full coverage for every surface, sealing the tooth, you get an advance of, of decay. Similarly, this next example, um, a three and a half year old child had a whole technique crown placed on the 6'4", with caries there on the mesial, came back finally at 15 months and looking quite sound there on the radiograph, okay? So we say that's a success. However, if you look down here at the 7'4 and the 7'5 with early decay there in the enamel, look what's happened here. Okay, so we're talking about high risk children who have got caries developing and they're not necessarily, um, they're erratic attenders. Um, and we know that we're seeing a result here of a, of a crown that affords protection to every surface. So we're not gonna get any more decay on that tooth. Okay, and finally, this is a really interesting uh, example because this is a child that came in, she was four and a half years old. She had a number of teeth that we could possibly have put whole technique crowns on, up here, and here, here. We chose to do two. We were trying to just, you know, we were testing this out. So we did two, one on the 6-4, one on the 8-4. The child came in 17 months later instead of the 12 months. And here we have the baseline again, okay? So the 8-4 and the 6-4. The crowns had fallen off three weeks before the child came in. They'd just come off, they'd debonded. We took bite wings and look what was found. No progression of decay. So over 17 months, we've sealed decay and it's not progressed. And then if you look at this 
tooth, the 8-5, same thing as on the previous radiographs. Nothing done with that tooth. Look what's happened here. So these are some of the results from our pilot study that are giving us, you know, real enthusiasm that this is, this is really a, an answer. And this is only one of the results. One of the main results, and I think you heard Deb speak this morning, is the, is the enthusiasm with which these children and their parents, families, are really picking up on this technique and, of, and the clinicians as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And overall, over our um, 22 children, over 12 months, we basically had no major failures. So we had no children that um, had abscessed, that, that the teeth abscessed on or that needed... Um, pulp treatment, and we had three minor failures, that is those, that child with the two crowns that came off and another child with one crown that came off and was just replaced. Okay, so in our next phase, um, which we have already, uh, which we're already well into, we're doing similar things. We're looking at the acceptability of the technique to children and their carers and, and uh, clinicians. We've increased the age group because we want to see more children. We only saw a small number of children in the pilot study. And, but importantly too, we're looking at the cost effectiveness of the technique compared to conventional restorations. Here's a technique where we're thinking you only need to put it on once and it stays there. If it comes off, well, you can just put it back on again, but it only needs to go on once and it is, we know that stainless steel crowns are the method that uh, are enduring until it's foliation and there's evidence for that. So we've widened our radiographic criteria where we were going. We were looking at, um, we were told that we were being too conservative by many eminent people. So we decided that we'd be a little bit more um, brave and we'd take the uh, cutoff point for the radiographic um, caries to the middle third of dentine. So instead of just going to the half, we'd extend it another, another third. We've also trained many dental and oral health therapists throughout the three agencies that um, we're now, we've now involved, we've involved two more agencies who see lots of large numbers of young children and we're using the facial image scale to assess children's acceptance of the technique. Um, across our three agency, agencies, Barwon, Monash and North Richmond, Barwon and Monash see many, many children um, and so this is just a, we have placed 251 crowns, Hall Technique crowns, over six months. So we finished up in April, and this is just an indication of how many crowns were placed by each agency, and each colour represents a clinician and how many they've placed themselves, and it obviously reflects the number of children they see. So 251 crowns placed, which exceeded our target. We really just kept gaining momentum. People became more and more enthusiastic about it as time went on. Um, here's a picture of some of our clinical staff. Um, I just wanted to follow on from a... Um, something that Professor Dewey said um, uh, in her presentation. She said, good clinical care is intimately linked with conducting research. And um, last year there was a, a review by the um, commissioned by the government that was uh, called the McKeon uh, Review of Health and Medical Research. And the key recommendation from this um, review was that research should be embedded within healthcare delivery. And this um, recommendation was supported by both sides of, all sides of politics. Um, and I really believe that the whole technique research that we're doing is a really good example of involving clinicians in trialling a technique that can be incorporated into their daily practice. And the clinicians have been incredibly enthusiastic about this, this technique and they have been so um, involved in and, and happy to take this on board. And we know that you, as clinicians you are very, very busy and there's a lot that's asked of you. Um, and um, one of the things um, that we've, we've really worked hard to do is to make sure that we try not to ask too much of the clinicians in terms of you know, paperwork and we've incorporated a lot of our data collection into titanium. Um, and, and really tried to make this a, an integrated part of, of a clinician's treatment planning. And um, we're finding as time's gone on that more and more clinicians who work within the agencies who weren't trained in this technique and who have, have become, um, have sort of taken on and are more interested in, in the technique and are tending to now refer more patients on and, and think about the whole technique as, a, as an option. 
So um, I think I'm probably going over time, but so just back to our, the example of some of our wonderful staff that have been involved, and Rosalie in the middle's here, and Rosalie is the one of all the staff who's placed the most tall technique crowns. She's placed 53 over the very short time. That, um, so there's no stopping some of our clinicians. They're just so excited about it. Um, so just in terms of uh, the numbers, we've seen 251 children had 251 children had two, uh, a crown placed in each of their mouths, um, and slightly smaller numbers of three-year-old children. This is just, I'm just showing you some very initial data from our first phase of, of our placement, so our baseline data. Um, we, you know, there may be some reasons why it's the younger children that we're not seeing in large numbers. There are some issues around taking good radiographs, and that, as I said again, I can't emphasise enough, it's a really important aspect of, of diagnosing and case management in this situation. Um, we just looked quickly at the time placing, take, taken for placement of the crown, and um, generally the majority of them are under six minutes, and that's, again, I say it's from testing the size to finishing off cement, cementing the crown. Um, but uh, there's a small group of, of crowns that will take a bit longer, um, and, and interesting, we looked at, um, at, at which month of placement. So in the early days, there were some that took a bit longer as, cl as clinicians were becoming a little bit more um, uh, familiar with the technique. Um, in terms of, I did actually present this slide to you last year because we had just looked at the parent and carer acceptability of the technique, but it's quite instructive in terms of what themes um, it shows in that the parents are very keen that it's pain-free quick and easy, no anaesthetic, no drill, and also that the child can feel a sense of achievement. Um, we similarly have looked at, uh, just had a quick look at the results we've got from our questionnaires um, this time around with our 251 parents and carers, and uh, some of the questions we've asked, similarly, they've generally strongly agreed with. Okay. Um, we, as I mentioned before, we use the facial image scale for the children because they're very young. It's a validated scale and really it was going to be the best way to ask them questions and get them to respond. So um, we've had a look at this and one of the interesting ones was generally they all, they, you know, were happy, a big smile or a smile. But one of the interesting ones was that we just wondered about was how did you feel when you had your silver tooth put on? So it was more a comfort level question and we just thought we'd have a quick look at the um, age distribution of that and um, interestingly um, it was more that sort of older level of kids that maybe were a bit neutral or um, maybe not so happy about it but we'll, we'll look a bit more at that too. We're going to be following these children now for two years. Um, we have had, we are funded by the William Buckland Foundation um, and these are our, our partners and we've got 3M who've donated the um, standard steel crowns. We're going to be following them and uh, we're going to be looking at the cost effectiveness as well. So we'll um, have some more results for you next year probably. And also as part of our... Um, as part of the project, we are developing a training program too and there's been a lot of interest. So um, if people uh, would, are interested, please feel free to contact me and that's me there. And thank you. I don't know if there's any time for questions, but thank you very much for this time.